just heard the gospel, the parable of the wicked vine dressers. You don't have too many vine dressers in the, in the world today. Maybe you know somebody who has vines in their backyard. Uh, reader Steve Roy has one in his backyard, so he's a vine dresser. But this is the parable of the wicked vine dresser. And it was pretty clear to those who heard what Jesus was saying in the day who he was talking about. He was talking about the authorities, especially the religious authorities in his day. Those who had been entrusted with the taking care of the vineyard, which is uh, another metaphor, the flock, the garden of God's people. Okay, And they had failed to render the due fruits. They had failed to do their job and to treat rightly their responsibility and those for whom they were responsible. And they were approaching it in a selfish way, in an abusive way. And whenever somebody was sent by the owner of the vineyard, in this case God, when he would send his prophets to correct them, what would they do? They would stone them, they would beat them, they would drive them out, and some they would even kill. We know that this happened often. We read the Old Testament and we see that the prophets weren't always you know, recognized as such. Even the Lord himself said, a prophet is, is welcome in every country but his own, right? He had a critical word to say. <coughs> and then finally he says in the parable, the owner of the vineyard said, I will send my son. They'll have to respect him. It wasn't a very good idea because what happened? When they saw the son, the wicked vine dresser said, that's the son. If we kill him, there's nobody left to claim the inheritance. We'll wait for the old man to die, and it'll be ours. We'll keep it all. And of course, this is in essence what they did to Christ, right? They said, here's the one coming as the son of God. He's a threat to our monopoly, our hegemony, whatever you want to call it, our privilege. We're going to knock him out and keep our positions. Because what he has to say is upsetting the apple cart. What is the parable end? What will the owner of that vineyard do when he comes back? And the people all said, he, they will punish those wicked vine dressers without mercy and will give the vineyard to those who will render the due fruits in their season. That was a powerful, powerful critique of the religious establishment of Jesus' day and the authorities there that were abusing their power. Do you think that that problem has been solved? Do you think that that problem just went away because Jesus came? Do you think that problem still exists in the world today? Well, you know it is, right? If you watched any of the news in the last few weeks, you know, you know that religious authorities continue to have a problem with their vine dressing. They have problems with their authority and abusing their positions of power and privilege. Now this problem is not isolated to one denomination, of course, and I would you know, be a fool to suggest such a thing. It has become extraordinarily problematic though within one that we know of, right? And that's the Roman Catholic Church, not just here in the United States, but across the world. And I'm not going to be triumphalistic about it because like I said, it's not isolated to them, it's not limited to them. However, I'm going to first, before I address our problems, I do want to address their problems from an outside orthodox position and just suggest maybe some of the contributing factors of why it has become, in essence, an epidemic in that church. And it has to do with theology. That's why I think it's a teachable moment for us so that we can understand the differences and the distinctions and the things that help these problems and abuses multiply so that we can avoid them in our own house. And it does have to do with theology. It starts with fundamental basics of theology, bad theology. You have a bad theology in the Roman Catholic Church about sin, which is where it all starts from. You have a culture which treats sin not in the patristic orthodox way, which sees it simply as a sickness and an affliction which is not natural to us, but which is meant to be 
thought and which is the purpose of Christ's coming. I mean, they, their theology might say that, but in practice we know that there is, there is a kind of a Catholic mentality about sin, which is all about the mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa, correct? It's, it's about shame, it's about guilt, it's about holding on and seeing ourselves as, as just the, the wickedest. Uh, one way you can see it is in the translation from the Vulgate, I believe, of, of Psalm 50, which, which in King James, I believe, it translates more correctly, in sins I was conceived, right? But in the Catholic translations that you see in like the Jerusalem Bible, I was a sinner from the moment of conception. That's a t totally different meaning of that verse. And uh, you find it even in some of our books, which, which unfortunately in our diocese have, have depended sometimes on Jerusalem Bible translations. That's not correct. You don't look at original sin as you have inherited the guilt of Adam and Eve, for example, or that you're intrinsically by nature a sinner. We don't have a sin nature. Human nature is created by God, good and pure. And it's because of our mortality in the flesh because we're subject to death, because we're weakened, we're like an immunity system that has been compromised, that we inevitably become sinners, but it is not inherent or intrinsic to our nature. It's something that is an affliction upon us, a parasite on us. So that's the proper understanding. But if you understand sin as something, you know, I am this massa peccata, I am this mass of sin, you identify with your sin, that's a bad theology. That's the first part. Because once you, that's embedded, okay, a whole host of bad choices result out of that. It's a big difference in my life if I think, well, I'm sick, so I can't do the things I want to do versus this is the only thing I'm able to do because this is the way I am, right? I'm going to make worse and worse decisions if I have that negative view. But if I have a positive view of humanity, created in the image and likeness of God, I'll make better decisions. So that's long story short there. That then leads to, unfortunately, in the Catholic Church, a bad theology of marriage, which is really important, because marriage is the fundamental human relationship from which all other familial relationships and societal relationships then descend. If you have a bad concept of marriage, you will have a bad concept of everything else. And unfortunately, in the Catholic Church, they uplift marriage beautifully, but they also, it's treated almost as uh, a necessary evil when it comes to the marital relations. I'm going to speak euphemistically today because we're a family church. Where the only use of that marital relationship that is, that is allowed is for the sake of procreation, for the begetting of children. And that is why uh, you then have issues like celibacy and the priesthood and so forth because any expression of, of that relationship is somehow still suspect. It's still somehow wrapped up with that concept of original sin and Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, you know this, right? Uh, I hope this is not news. And and the the, the 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 confusion around the issue of this part of our human nature and the shame that gets wrapped around with it, particularly in the theology of that church, which can also be has been adopted at times, unfortunately, by Orthodox churches over the last several hundred years, mistaken, is part of that problem, which then gives rise to more and more corruptions of understanding. Right? If you see sexuality as an evil thing, or as a dirty thing, or as an unholy thing, which it is absolutely not, that is going to give rise to a whole host of bad decisions. Right? It's a, it's a further development of the first problem. Because of that association of sexuality with sin, therefore priesthood in the Roman Catholic Church, we get to the third problem, bad ecclesiology, bad concept of priesthood. The idea that a person who is sexually active cannot be a priest, which is completely alien both to the Old and the New Testaments and to the first thousand years of Christianity, becomes the norm in that church. That is itself the perversion. I have to say it, it's the perversion. The understanding that a married man should be a priest is normative to both Judaism and to Orthodox Christianity. We do allow for celibate priesthood and monastic priesthood, but it's because we understand 
that monasticism is an alternate form of marriage in the sense that one has betrothed themselves to Christ. They're still living out that fundamental human relationship of marriage, but in the context of a celibate relationship to Christ in marriage, which is weird sounding maybe to us because we're hypersexualized in society. But that's how it's understood in the, in the literature and the language and even in the tonsuring of monastics. It's like a wedding service. So because own, you know, no married men were allowed except in like the Byzantine Catholic and so forth, which are just kind of co-opted Orthodox churches, what you had was a complete unbalancing of the population of those who sought holy orders in the Roman Catholic Church, which meant those who were not interested in marriage to a woman were the ones who went into it, which also means then, what? A high preponderance of people who don't have heterosexual orientation. That's what happened. This is not a secret, though it's though you'd think that with the Apostolic Nuncio who recently published about Cardinal McCarrick in Washington, like this is breaking news. Most people knew that this was an issue. Twenty years ago, uh, when I was an intern for the OCA in Syosset, I stayed in a seminary on Long Island with some of the other seminarians from who were working at the Chancery. And we got to meet some of the Catholic seminarians. And one was very frank with us about the culture within the seminary of alternate lifestyles. Yeah. It was absolutely no secret, and they were unabashed to talk about it. Shock to me at the time, not so much anymore. And because of this, a whole lot of problems developed, of course, in their church. Now, add to this another bad theology. A bad theology of priesthood which says, once a priest, always a priest. This idea that you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's Jesus. That's not the ordained priest who is an icon of Jesus. The normative canonical order of the church for the first thousand years in both East and West, and still the canonical order in the Orthodox Church, is that a priest who commits in abuse of authority, particularly of an intimate physical kind, you know what I'm saying, is defrocked. There is no, well, he's still a priest forever, according to the order. No! He is an abuser, and he is a wolf in sheep's clothing, and he needs to be removed, and that's what they do. That's what we do. We don't reassign the person to another diocese and hope they'll do better next time, which is criminal negligence. Okay? Now, that's, that's their problem that they have to sort out. They have to get right the idea of sin. They have to get right the idea of marriage. They have to get right the idea of priesthood. And then maybe they'll start to be able to fix their problems. But until then, I hope we'll see something happen for them, but I don't think that they can solve those problems because they're systemic. Now, add to that the culture of shame, addiction, abuse of families, you know, and that understanding of how, you know, that is now writ large on that whole church. It's like, it's like a, a family with a dirty secret that tries to hide as long as it can from the public what's going on. Now it's failing. And everything's blowing up. God have mercy. God have mercy. But I'm going to tell you that their problem is not unique to them. It's just particularly virulent there because of their problems that I described. Okay. The problem also exists in every other church, in every other community in which you have authority and power and so forth. It's just the nature of dysfunctional human life. Okay. It's because we live in a fallen world. Every church of every type has this problem in some form or another, including the Orthodox Church. We know this is very clear. Last year, uh, two major high-profile scandals broke in, uh, in the Church of Romania with two bishops who were, who were caught in these scandalous type of situations doing the exact same type of things that you hear happen. And we have in our own diocese an auxiliary bishop who was defrocked and who is now in open schism because he refused to accept the discipline of the church. The problem continues goes on and on and on. So what do we do about it? Here's my question to you. 
I'm going uh, next week, September 6, 7, 8, I'll be at our Episcopal Congress where I've, had, I've kept my head low for a few years, but this year I think I'm going to make some enemies again and see what I can do. <laughs> see what fires I can start. And one of the things I'm going to ask is a question that they should have asked at the All-American Council, but I believe nobody asked this question, which is an absolute scandal to me. And that is, we have policies, procedures, uh, and guidelines for how to prevent abuses from happening within the church. That includes making sure that every parish is in compliance with those policies, that they're doing the things that they're supposed to do, right? Nobody at the All-American Council that I know of asked the question, what percentage of parishes are in actual compliance with those policies, procedures, and guidelines? Because they can say, oh yes, we're making progress, we're doing really well. Okay, well that sounds great. What number? What percentage? 50%? If you say 51%, that's a majority of our parishes are in compliance. Batting 500 might be good in Major League Baseball, but it is worthless when it comes to this issue in the church. We want 1,000, nothing less. Right? We want every church to be a safe place for children, for seminarians, for young people. We do not want wicked vinegressers working the field. And we're all wicked in some sense, but do you know what I mean? I have to ask, I have to ask my bishop, I have to ask the, the, the Episcopal Council, what percentage of our parishes in our diocese are in compliance with those policies and procedures? What are they, are they all taking the correct steps? And I know for a fact that it's not going to be very high. As I was on a physical council, I know. Your job is to ask on a yearly basis, minimum, to your priest, me, to your parish council members, your parish council president, if you weren't, okay? <laughs> the same question. Is our parish in compliance so that we're doing everything that we can to protect and prevent abuses from happening. Now, since since you asked, I'm happy to say that we are, as far as I know, 100% in compliance. Uh, though I'm sure there's a couple people who squeak through that we haven't done all their checking first. But what are the policies that we include? That means check background checks for everybody who's in a position of authority, everybody who's teaching, everybody who's working with children. When we have an event with young people, and that's under 18 years old, basically, and preferably even older, we always try to have two adults present. Even when I go to do house blessings, I prefer if there's always at least two adults present. I do not like to go to a house blessing for an individual person, male or female, because nowadays you just don't know. You have to be compliant and, and think about these things. Now, there's a reason they had things like deaconesses in the ancient church. It was to help them make sure that ministry was being done in an accountable manner. That's, in my opinion, the greatest argument for returning it, because we're living in Roman times again. Not for any other reason. In any case, maybe in all kinds of states. <laughs> um, <laughs> we background checks on all the people, we make sure there's the two, the two deep, whatever you want to call that, there's always two adults present. Everything we do is in a place where it should be visible. Uh, you know, even the confessional has a window so you can see what's going on in there. Uh, classrooms all have windows, you know, etc. There's more policies. We make sure our teachers take training so that they can understand these kind of issues. And, and we need to do more, I'm sure of it, but we're on the right track for sure, and we're definitely approaching 100% on a regular basis. Which you should ask, because the problem is that's only good, you know, it's only good, it's like your laundry. You can wear the same shirt, but it's after three days, you know, forget it. It needs to go to the wash. So every year, we have to make sure that we are continuing to do the same thing. If you have never asked a person in authority at your church, the priest or a member of the council or even their Sunday school teacher, 
A, do you have policies and procedures in place? And two, are you in compliance with them? Newsflash, you are part of the problem. You are part of the reason that this has gone on for so long. You, because you're lazy and naive, don't do that. What will you say to that child whose life has been destroyed by a vicious, wicked vine dresser? What will you look in their face and say, I thought it was okay. They seemed nice. I liked them. They gave good sermons. What will the judgment day be for you? What will it be? We cannot afford to let this go on any longer in our church and any church. Preach it from the mountains. If you have Catholic friends, you light a fire <coughs> under them. You tell them what I told you today. Get this fixed. The biggest enemy of Christianity today is not the atheist. It's not the coalitions out there. It's the lazy, naive people in the pews doing nothing that they were supposed to do. That's what it is. Got it? Got it. Say amen. 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 Judgment is now on you. Christ is among us. <laughs>